Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Phoenix Fellowship Live. I'm Pastor Chilson. I will be your host today as we peruse through the story from the Bible about the death, resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is Passover, i.e. Resurrection Weekend, the weekend that many years ago Jesus sacrificed his life and rose from the dead for us. And we are celebrating that death and resurrection today as we study from God's word. Last evening, we had a virtual communion service here. We used the tool of zoom.com to actually interface with one another, and we each made our own or secured our own bread and our wine, our grape juice, and we celebrated communion together and recounted some of the events of Christ's life just before his death. Jesus, you know, Paul says in Corinthians, is our Passover. And we are so glad that he has taken our place in death. But that death was not the final word for him or us because of his resurrection. And so we celebrate that today. I want to tell you just one thing about what we're planning for this week. Um, last evening, when we had communion together, there were some difficulties that some of our members had in actually accessing the video, and some even were not able to get online to participate in that communion service. Zoom is an incredible piece of technology that we are using now, as many are in our world during this time of social distancing, to use a term that's familiar with everyone. And Zoom has updated its security settings, has held webinars of which I have been a part to make sure that the application is safe for our users to use. And so we are going to have a test Zoom meeting next Monday evening. And I will send out an email to everyone giving you the best instructions that I can find on how to actually download, check in, and get onto our Zoom meetings, which we will have each week. We do our live broadcasts through YouTube streaming on Sabbath mornings, every Sabbath morning at 11 o'clock. And during the week, starting next week, and we will announce the actual day and time on Monday, we will be holding Bible studies and discussions to follow. We can talk to one another after a Bible study, concentrating on the prophecies of the Bible that have to do with the times we're living in and the times that will come as we approach the coming of Christ. So look for that email, and we hope that you will be able to join us during the week for not only the test, the test uh, Zoom meeting on Monday evening, but also the Bible study that will follow later in the week. Today, we're going to be studying the story, as I said, of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and what that means for us. Before we do, I'd like to pray. Father in heaven, today, thank you for your gift to us, the gift of Jesus Christ, your son. Thank you for sending him to us to redeem us from a dark, an eternal destiny because of our sin. Thank you for his life, for his death, for his resurrection, for his position at your right hand even now, at the throne of God, the throne of grace, where we can come boldly now before you because of him. We pray this morning, Father, that you will give to us your spirit, that you will send him among us. This little gathering, even though it is a gathering that is somewhat virtual in nature, it is a gathering of your people, your church. And I pray that you will send your spirit among us as we study your word and discuss the implications of this story in our lives. I pray that all in Jesus' name. Amen. A good story always has a context. And before we talk about the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ, 
I'd like to go back as we did last evening when some of you were not here. I would like to go to last evening and review just some of the things that led up to this story of today. We talk about Passion Week. Passion Week, when does it start? Well, usually we start Passion Week on Sunday. That's when when we, that's the beginning of the week and that's when Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the colt and everyone was proclaiming him king. It was a very incredible experience for the people that were following him. And they, they were uh, wanting to make him king. But that is not when I start Passion Week for me. Because for me, it started on the Sabbath evening, the Saturday night before that triumphal entry into Jerusalem. To me, it started in Bethany. When Mary was at the feet of Jesus, anointing his feet, Jesus said she was anointing him for his burial. He was talking about what was coming to his disciples and to those who were following him long before it happened. And yet even after that, they didn't know. They had no idea what was going to happen. But he was talking to them and they weren't listening. They weren't hearing. It was like their eyes were clouded with the events of the moment. Something that we can also do sometimes is allow the, the events and the activities and the concerns and the responsibilities and the stresses of this life blind us from that which is so important in our life and our relationship with Christ. So Sabbath evening at Simon's house, Simon had held a feast for Jesus and Mary is the star of that evening. It's also the evening which is when Judas decided pretty clear from the scriptures because that's the very next story it's when Judas who was there also decided that he was going to betray Christ he was appalled that Jesus would even allow Mary to wash his feet to break that perfume that expensive perfume he said which could have been used to help the poor well yeah right the poor he who was dipping his hand into the till and and using the money for his own use. So the next week, later that in the middle of the week, J Judas made a deal with the Pharisees to betray Christ. But then we see Mary at the beginning of this Passion Week, in my mind, be beginning of the Passion Week, and guess who is there at the end of Passion Week when Jesus comes forth from the grave? Who is waiting for him at the tomb? Mary. The story of Mary is a story that will always warm our hearts, and it should. And Jesus said her story would always be told wherever the gospel is preached. Then on Sunday morning, Jesus did ride into Jerusalem. He cleansed the temple. He went in and turned over tables and carried his whip and, and chased everyone out of the temple who was using it as a local market as it were, selling animals for sacrifices, changing money from the Roman coin to the temple coin. It was chaotic and it was a disgrace to be taking place in a holy place. So he did that right after he rode into Jerusalem on Sunday. On Monday and Tuesday, he's teaching his disciples, he's interacting with the Jews, and he's probably spending the night either on the Mount of Olives or at Mary, Martha, and Lazarus's house. So that's what's happening until Wednesday when, when Jesus, when Jesus is alone, apparently. Jesus is alone. Judas is making his deal with the Jewish leaders. Jesus is alone. No doubt contemplating all that is about to transpire here in the next couple of days. I can't imagine what that day must have been like for Jesus. No doubt he was reviewing the prophecies in his mind. He probably knew them by heart, but he was reviewing the prophecies of the Old Testament in his mind about what was to happen and how that would play out in his life. No doubt he was talking much with his father 
And we don't even know, perhaps there were angels that were there, or maybe Elijah and Moses, like they were on the Mount of Transfiguration, carrying him through this moment of time when he would be prepared for what was ahead. We know that Jesus received assistance from heaven because even in Gethsemane, an angel came and gave him strength at a time when he was about to die under the weight of sin even before he got to the cross. Then Thursday, the Passover, a lamb is killed, the supper is prepared, Jesus is not there, but his disciples have been commissioned to prepare for the Passover feast. And something that you may not realize is that after the Passover supper, after the, the Passover, what we would call the communion service today, after the receiving of the emblems of his body and his blood, Jesus spent much time that evening in the upper room with his disciples. John 14 through 16 are chapters that tell of the conversation, the things that he was telling them. He was trying to prepare them for what was coming because they weren't prepared. He was trying to prepare them. He was trying to give them assurance. His words right at the beginning of John 14 are, let not your heart be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. I have prepared a place for you and I'm going to leave you, but when I leave, I will come again. I will prepare a place and come again and take you to be with me where I am. That was the beginning of John 14 and those three chapters, 14, 15, and 16, are part of what Jesus talked to his disciples about that Wednesday evening. Sometimes in the past, I know my, for myself, and I, when I have conducted communion services, we go right from the emblems, the receiving of the emblems to reading that passage where it says, and they sang a song and left. So it's like from the time of the receiving of the emblems until Gethsemane, it was just a moment. It was like a left upper room and Jesus went directly to Gethsemane. But Jesus at this hour of trial is so concerned about his disciples that he spends this time with them after the meal and tried to give them instruction that would encourage their hearts. If not that night, if not that weekend, after, the, after his resurrection. The beautiful story of Jesus' love for his disciples and for us, the things that he gave us during that time. Then, of course, Gethsemane, where Jesus sweat great drops of blood from the weight of the sin that was on his shoulders even then before the cross. And the, the betrayal of Judas, the mockery of a trial or trials. Finally, he's taken to Calvary where he offers his life as a sacrifice for us. What really happened that day on Friday? What really happened that day? When we talk about, when we talk about the crucifixion of Jesus Christ, we often think of the pain that he went through, the agony of the physical torture of the cross. The cross is a very cruel instrument of death and very painful. And we often focus on that, but think about it for a minute. A lot of people have been crucified over the years of Earth's history. In fact, there were two others, one on either side that were crucified next to him. They weren't Christ. What was it about Calvary that really is important for us to see? I don't ever want to depreciate the, the physical agony that he went through, but that is not what his sacrifice was about. That is not what it was about. Let's think about this for a moment. Who was being crucified? that day in the middle of those two thieves. Who was being crucified? Jesus. Jesus. Who was Jesus? Ah, the creator of the heavens and the earth. The one who flung the stars into space. The one who made mankind. 
with all of the intricacies of the human body, sight, vision, smell, the feeling of our body, the organs inside the heart, the heart. The heart is a masterpiece of creation. How does this keep beating? Well, I believe, and maybe we'll use this as an illustration sometime, that it's actually the life of heaven that actually creates that impulse in the heart that keeps it beating because there's no outside source. It's an amazing creation of God, the body of man and woman, and the co-creation capabilities of having children. It's an amazing thing. This is the person who created all these things who hung on the cross. This is the one who left heaven. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich beyond that, yet he became poor. And that isn't even adequate. That we, through his poverty, might be rich. It's an amazing gift that God gave us in Jesus Christ as our Passover, as our sacrifice. And what was the cause of death? It was not the bleeding. It was not, it was not the suffocation, which is ultimately the result of crucifixion. It was not the pain. It was not his heart just giving out finally from the torture. It was our sin. And not my sin alone, not your sin alone, but the sin of the world. He bore that and felt the guilt of that as if it were his own that day on Calvary. And it finally, at that last moment when he cried, it is finished, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. It was at that moment the sins of the world were placed entirely upon his shoulders and he felt the penalty, the guilt for our sin and it crushed out his life. What were the, what were the results of that death? We're going to read some verses in just a moment, but I just want to, I want to think out loud with you for a moment. What were the consequences of that death for us? He said before he died, now is the prince of this world cast down. The ruler of this earth who had usurped the rule of Adam in Eden and had become the prince of this world as the Bible calls him, he was cast down. His power was broken. Jesus planted his flag, the flag of his kingdom, in earthly soil that day in the cross and raised his standard as the rightful owner and ruler of this world and mankind. Not only that, he gained our victory over sin. No longer, no longer, as, as much as the devil would like to make you think so, does he have power over you. No longer. Your guilt is erased. The power of sin over you in your life is broken. This sinless sacrifice bought us eternal life and banished Satan from having power, even though he, again, wants to make us think that he is still in charge of our lives. He comes to us and he harasses us and he discourages us. He is not in charge anymore. Our union with Christ through his birth, Bethlehem, through him taking upon himself our humanity and becoming a part of us, part of our family, 
gave us the victory over sin and over guilt and over death and the right to eternal life. His death gives us credit for having paid for the sin of our life in him. And incidentally, and it should be mentioned, there is no double jeopardy with God. When sin has been paid for, when your sin has been paid for, you don't have to face that again. When you are declared not guilty, when you are acquitted from your sin, there is no judgment left for you to face. Jesus said in John chapter 5, he said, He who believes in me has eternal life and has passed from death to life and shall not enter into judgment. Why? Because Jesus went to judgment on our behalf. And our union with him gives us safety from having to ever face the results of our sins again. I remember hearing as a young person that text. It was one of my memory verses. I talked about memory verses last night. One of the texts that I memorized as a child in church school was, He who confesses his sins is God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And it says, if we confess our sins, it makes it appear as if confession is the means by which we are forgiven our sins. It is not so. It only means that if we are confessing him, if we have that attitude, our sins are forgiven. Our sins were forgiven at Calvary. And confession is just a good exercise of our own hearts toward God in our relationship with him to acknowledge our need for his grace and for his love. So, there is good news in the story of Calvary. It is a wonderful story that gives us so many benefits. And Paul says, if one died, all died. Our union with Christ means that we were there that day. He paid for our sins. It's all of him. It's all of him and none of us. I'd like to read to you a, a quotation, a, a something that Charles Spurgeon wrote many years ago back in the 1800s. A great man of faith, Charles Spurgeon, one of the great men of faith, and he was certainly one. He wrote a book called All of Grace. It's a beautiful book. I can't say everything in is something I might agree with, but the theme is, it is all of grace. It is not of me. And this is what he says in his book regarding the sacrifice of Christ. Jesus has borne the death penalty on our behalf. Behold the wonder. There he hangs upon the cross. This is the greatest sight you will ever see. Son of God and Son of Man, there he hangs, bearing pains unutterable, the just for the unjust, to bring us to God. Oh, the glory of that sight, the innocent punished, the Holy One condemned, the ever-blessed made a curse, the infinitely glorious put to a shameful death, and that's part of the atrocity of his crucifixion is that we would put him on the cross. A shameful death. The more I look, he says, Charles Spurgeon says, the more I look at the sufferings of the Son of God, the more sure I am that they must meet my case. Why did he suffer if not to turn aside the penalty from us? If then he turned it aside by his death, it is turned aside. And those who believe in him need not fear it. What a beautiful statement. What a beautiful assurance. The sacrifice of Christ was sufficient. 
When Jesus cried out on the cross that day, it is finished. It was finished. All that was left for us was to come along, to be born, to hear the word of truth, the gospel of our salvation, and place our faith in Christ. I'd like to tell you a story, and I'd like, for, I'd like to show you a slide to illustrate the story that I'm going to tell you. This first slide, I have three of them, is a slide <clears throat> that illustrates what I grew up with as a Christian. Being in a Christian home, being in a pastor's home, not everyone that is a Christian knows what ha actually has happened through Jesus Christ, knows the salvation that has come to us through him. And so this first slide shows a line of our life, the line of our life, the ups and the downs of our growth in Christ. And what's interesting about this slide is, and you've heard those terms, justification, sanctification, I had one of them, our members say one time recently, sometime I'd like to hear you talk about the difference between justification, sanctification, and how they relate to one another. And so this is the way I was taught the relationship between justification and sanctification. As a young person, I had to come to Christ right at the beginning. Below the line, I was unsaved. But when I heard about Jesus' sacrifice for me, I accepted him as my savior. And then I began a walk, an upward walk with him. The Holy Spirit was given to me in my heart, caused me to lead a more fruitful life for him. But there were ups and downs. I would just be discouraged now and then. I'd be tempted beyond my ability to resist. There would be the down times and the up times, the renewal, the revival, the things that would make me come back closer to Christ, and gradually, 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 gradually over the years, my life trend would go up. And what's interesting about this is that the more I was sanctified, the less justification I needed. The less of Christ's merits I needed as my merits increased. This is false. This is a false gospel. There is no point in time where I need less of his merits covering me because even in my growth in him, even as I walk with him closer every day, there is never a time when my efforts, my works, my righteousness are good enough to dispense with his merits, his works on my behalf, his righteousness. Until the day this chart shows, until finally when Jesus comes, we have reached that top level of sanctification and no longer need his justifying grace. I go to the next slide because the next slide even makes it more interesting. Along with this theory comes the idea that ultimately we reach a state of perfection of sinlessness. Can you imagine? Of sinlessness. Do I want to, in my life with Christ, less and less fall into the trap of doing things that are inconsistent with my life in him? Absolutely. I want to commit those sins in my life less and less, but there is never a time and never a time when I reach that state of sinlessness, partly because even if I never did anything wrong ever again, how about the nature that is still within me? How about my sinful nature that needs to be covered by his merits? There is never a time when there is such a thing as perfect holiness until, as the scriptures say, this mortal puts on immortality and this corruption puts on incorruptions. corruption. Philippians 1.6, it says that Jesus, but it says, um, we can be confident of this very thing, 
that he who began a good work in us will finish it until the day of Jesus Christ. It will not be until that day when he comes, when our sin, sin nature is abandoned. These bodies, these mortal bodies will be abandoned and we will have a body like his, like Jesus. And so the third slide shows the more correct understanding of justification. When Jesus died on the cross, he died for my sins, past, present, and future. And when I place my faith in him, I have right standing. My position, as it shows on the chart, my position with Christ is right up there at the top. I walk as a saint before the Father. I walk with the record of Jesus Christ covering my record of sin. And yes, there is a fight of faith. And yes, there is a growing experience once we come to Christ. Gradually up, hopefully, less of me and more of him, less of my old nature ruling and more of the spirit life moving within me. But finally, when it's all said and done, it's his life that covers mine completely. And so I take you to Galatians chapter 6 and verse 14 today, which, which is where Paul says in, in response to what I've just shared to you, because that is the truth of scripture. He says, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. There is nothing for us to glory in. Nothing. Our attempts, the pretense of our righteousness is undermined. Our efforts are discredited as meritorious toward salvation. Therefore, I will glory only in the cross of my Lord Jesus Christ. In Romans chapter 4 and verse 2, and I'll read that to you. Romans chapter 4 and verse 2. And you can turn in your Bibles if you have your Bible with you. A good thing for you to have when we talk from scriptures like with the, this morning. In Romans chapter 4, the, the very first verse, Paul says, What then shall we say that Abraham our father has found according to the flesh? That is, according to our natural nature. For if Abraham was justified by works... He has something to boast about, right? If he was justified from the things that he did, from the, the nature, the natural nature that he was able to overcome, there's reason for boast. And believe me, the Pharisees of Jesus' day, the scribes and the Pharisees did plenty of that. Talks about how they would wrap those righteous robes around themselves and walk around and in the temple they would say father i thank you that i am not like that publican over in the corner they were broadcasting they were broadcasting even those days they were broadcasting their righteousness it says if abraham who was our father and who is the father of the faithful those who are believers in jesus if he was justified by works he has something to boast about. He was a good man. He was a faithful follower of Jesus Christ. But, it says, not before God. God knows what we are. God knows what we are made of. He knows the nature with which we are born that will not change until the day Jesus comes. Yes, we grow. Yes, we we become more like Jesus every day, but the gospel is not, hear me, please, the gospel is not becoming a portrait of Christ. The gospel is the story of Jesus living my life and die my death and giving me credit for everything he did in exchange for my faith in him. First Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 18, Paul says, The message of the cross is foolish, foolishness to those who are being lost, but the power of God for those of us who are being saved. The message of the cross pulls the rug out from under those who have great faith 
and great confidence in their own righteousness. So that's what happened at Calvary. Jesus took our place. He became our sacrifice. He died the eternal death, and had he not been the Son of God, and had not the Father called him forth that Sunday morning, he would never have come back from the grave, for he died our death that day. But that wasn't the end of the story. Remember how Paul Harvey used to always say, and here is the rest of the story. Here is the rest of the story. First of all, what happened on that Sabbath day after his death? He was laid to rest Friday evening. He rested on the Sabbath, the very day that we are coming apart to be with him today. That day is still the same day. There are people that want to call the Lord's Day a different day. And God bless them. They are sincere, I know, in their, in their belief. But God said in Isaiah, the Sabbath was his holy day. And that's the day that we continue to worship him on and have as Christians ever since the cross. We can find Christians observing the Sabbath throughout the ages from the cross until today. And the disciples kept the Sabbath. We'll study that another day. But Jesus rested on the Sabbath. And in Hebrews chapter four, oh, I have to read this to you. Hebrews chapter four and verses nine and 10. This relates so much to what we're talking about today. Hebrews four verses nine and 10 is about the seventh day Sabbath rest and God says, it, it talks about it in, in uh, verse 4, but in, in Hebrews 4.4, 4, it talks about the seventh day. God rested from all his works. <clears throat> and then he says in verse 9, and we won't study the whole passage, but this is, this, is a, this is a passage that reaffirms that the Sabbath is truly a symbol of our resting in the grace of Christ. In verse 9 it says, There remains therefore a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered into his rest <laughs> has also ceased from his works as God did from his. Remember in uh, Genesis, Genesis uh, 2? We have Jesus, after the creation of the world, resting from his works. And what did he do after his works of salvation? After his life here on this earth, after his sacrifice, after his taking our place in life and death, what did he do? He rested on the Sabbath. He rested in the tomb. I think it's significant that it was the Sabbath on the the day that he rested in the tomb. But that too was not the end. Death did not have the final word for him either, no more than it does for us. For in Colossians chapter two, I would like to read Colossians chapter two. And we're reading verses 10 through 13. What happened? on that Sunday morning. What really happened? Yes, Jesus came forth from the grave. He met Mary at the tomb. He visited his disciples that evening. He spent some time with the two on the road to Emmaus that day. Some amazing other stories associated with his resurrection story. But what really happened on that Sunday morning? You and I came forth from the grave in him just as we had been on the cross with him, in him, he taking our place in death. And now we came forth in him from the grave. Listen to this. Colossians chapter two, beginning with verse 10. First, Paul says, you are complete in him. I love that passage, that, that phrase. And I look to you today and I say to you as my hearers, you are complete in him. And then Paul says in verse 11, 
in him you were also circumcised in him we were circumcised in him with the circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ we were buried with him he says you were buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead and you being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh he has made alive together with him having forgiven you all your sin it's a beautiful beautiful passage i'd like to end today with the actual story of the resurrection found in john chapter in john chapter 20 where this is the story of the tomb where Mary met Jesus. I'm reading John chapter 1, I'm sorry, John chapter 20, verse 1, and it says there, Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early. While it was still dark, and she saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb, then she ran and came to Simon Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved. Didn't he love them all? I think John was special to his heart. And said to them, they have taken away the Lord out of the tomb and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple, John, he always calls himself the other disciple, and were going to the tomb so they both ran together and John got there first. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there. Yet he did not go in, but Peter did. When Peter followed it up and got to the tomb, you know, Peter, he had to see. He went right in. And he, too, saw the linen cloths lying there and the handkerchief that had been around his head not lying with the other linens, but folded together in a place by itself. Then John, who came to the tomb first, went in also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture or all the things that Jesus had told them. After three days I will, be, I will raise, rise again, that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes but mary stood outside by the tomb weeping and as she wept she stooped down and looked into the tomb and she saw two angels in white sitting one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of jesus had laid then the angel said to her woman why are you weeping she said to them, because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but did not know that it was him. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Then Jesus said to her, Mary. Can't you hear him? In that tender voice, he says, Mary. And she turned to him and said, Teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father, but go and tell my brethren and say to him, them, I am ascending to my father and to your father, to my God and to your God. And you know some of the other pieces of the story, how Jesus met the two on the road to Emmaus and visited with them. And then they, he told them the prophecies that, he would, they were bewildered, just like the disciples. They didn't know what was supposed to happen. 
They thought that was the end of the story. It was not the end of the story. And Jesus helped them to see that all that had happened that weekend in Jerusalem was according to prophecy. Then he met with the disciples. And then, of course, again, later, about a week later, he made breakfast for them on the side, the, uh, the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And finally, they saw him ascend into heaven, where we are still waiting for him to return and believe he will do so soon. This is such a message of hope, and I pray that God will give you that hope that comes, that blessed hope that comes from placing your faith in the grace of God that is greater than your sin. Let's pray. Father, today we are so blessed to have this story know what you have done for us. Thank you for the writers of the Bible which have given us an account not only of your life and death and resurrection and ascension, of the hope of your coming again, but of all that it means for us, the implications for us and our future, our destiny. Bless each person this morning who have heard these words and give them the faith that they need to place in you the hope that is theirs and can be theirs because of your story. I pray these things in Jesus' name. And now we have before you a slide that shows you how you can reach us if you want to contact us, our email address, our phone number, and the website, which is where we keep each of these messages that are being presented on Sabbath morning, and you can access them through the week or any time or share them with others. They are the links to our YouTube channel is on our website under the ministry tab, the ministry tab. You will see it there. And I invite you to go there and to explore what we have placed there for your enjoyment and for your, um, for your encouragement, the things that will help you understand a little more what the Phoenix Fellowship is all about, what we believe, why we believe it, and how excited we are to share it. God bless each one of you this week. And may you have the hope that is yours, the covering that is yours in Christ. Goodbye. See you next Sabbath morning.